Welcome back, fellow armchair generals. This is Gamer1745 here with my continuing playthrough of Hearts of Iron 3 with Black Ice 9.11. And we're going to continue this. We're getting awfully close to kicking things off. March isn't quite there. If you look here and do something like this and go... Oh, no, that isn't that so bad. Okay. Just maybe the weather's turned a bit before when I did that. The speed was... Okay, yeah, see here, terrain. Minus, okay. Well, that isn't so bad. Okay, maybe just some places. We had been having some bad weather. But it may have improved. I'm thinking... May right now. That's what I'm thinking. Yeah, and we're, we're building up our metal. Part of the reason. Thinking May. Take down Poland by the end of May. And be um, ready to go west by the beginning of June or very close to that. Is what I'm thinking for timing right now. There's no point in going to war and then just sitting there going, Hi! You know, like, what happened, I mean, the more I read about it, the more I'm convinced that Hitler really thought the, um, the British particularly, but also the French, without, the British weren't going to, the French weren't going to do anything without the British, weren't going to inter intervene over Poland. So they really thought they were going to have their own little war. Um, because you don't invade Poland and then go, oops, we've got, really almost too bad a weather to get across because I was just reading that that winter the um, 39 to 1940 winter was one of the coldest it had been in a long time um, so uh, the, the Kiel Canal um, froze over for at least part of it so you don't you don't go to go to war right then you know Unless, of course, somebody attacks you, like, you know, the French were attacked. Well, I mean, they attacked Poland and the French, and the British reacted to it. So, yeah, at that point. But you don't start one. So, we're going to see about doing this a little smarter. Okay, Hufta, great. Which now puts that um, much further ahead. And, well. I think that does allow us, yes, active sonar here. I'll do that. Now, what I've done is sent these guys here. And we're going to have them. So these near divisions, they're not quite divisions, they, they're a bit weak. Um, well, it's a decent amount of cavalry, and those elite light infantry are actually pretty good. Unless you want to pull those up somebody else to attach to somebody else. Oh, wrong way. There we go.
close enough attention the first time. There we go. And after a point, all Roman numerals start looking the same. Just a bunch of X's and I's and B's. And unless you really like counting things like that. Um, well, wait on that. Not too long. I'll just... Especially now, this could be a faster unit. You have the cavalry, but without heavy artillery, it really slows it down. Um, so having these mixed support, I don't think will be the slowest thing there. Um, you now that heavy artillery is. So either you want to speed it up or get rid of that. I'm gonna just do it a little bit better. There we go. This one of the weaker units definitely needs a little more fighting punch. Useful. Okay, and what I thought about doing here is um, yeah, let's do some of that. Okay, and um, let's check out Gadarian here and see how it would look like. Okay, um, yeah, it has one free slot. Yeah, some heavy AA. Let's see, will that slow this down? Okay, um... Now the artillery there is slower, the medium artillery there is slower. Probably say speed that up, but... Okay. And let's try harps. Core. We might do that one. Let's back it. Um, hmm, we have a bunch, don't we? Yes, got to scroll up. Okay. Um, oh, there's core. And then, yeah, that'd probably be a good, good mix. Now, um, hmm, well, good about Treppenberg here, so we got a mix support armored car. Well, That'd definitely use it. Okay. So we're gonna do the twenty seventh Panzer Division. We're gonna take that. Let's see if we can find that here. It's in the stack. Uh, there it is. Under Randulik. I'm probably mispronouncing that, but oh well. And um where is it? Von Runsted. So we're gonna um at least for now. Tat von Runstedt's um Battle Commander here, which gives a lot of neat bonuses. You don't need um, a headquarters if you are if you have that, but I'm not going to pull it off just because now the other thing I was thinking about is there. That that's also a little better spot for it. I don't know, but what we can do is put on put in some like the those guys. The other one I was thinking of is Von Thelma, but we do have with combined arms, we already have that there. So that's good. Okay, um... Von Schreckenberg, Hoppners, Guderians, Harps. Oh, okay. Yeah, that would be Let's see. Um, what do we 
got there. Okay, elite light infantry and commandos. Uh, so let's grab that and this. Now let's put these guys. So this is now a um, pretty well organized up elite fighting force. Got the Brandenburgers there with the Gross Deutschland Infantry Regiment, which is vastly over strength. Not necessarily from historical. I don't know exactly what the historical strength of that was, but I, it's, it's sort of like the idea that... Um, Leapstandart was often a regiment when it was actually sort of divisional size. That is a little big, but um, pretty big itself, so doing a similar sort of thing. Now, um, That's doing okay. Um, is he going to be a fighting unit? Maybe, likely. Okay. Um, we just have this one army corps here. Oh, well, maybe it's up here then. Uh, well, there's a toss little group there. I could use some. He's a pretty good Panzer commander. I don't know. Maybe we should just... What's it? Harp. Let's improve Harp's core here. Motorized support. That. Okay, well that's pretty well improved. Um, to a point all that's unnecessary to defeat Poland, they just got a more or less shell of one division, a few places make it a bit more, but um, let's come in and crush it. A little weaker than sometimes, um, for several reasons. One, we got a few more headquarters than we did regular divisions, I think, than normal out of Czechoslovakia. And because of that building limitation, The IC limitation, I should say. And we didn't build as much. Okay, well that's sort of what I wanted to do with those mixed support type units. And those heavy anti-aircraft guns. That flappy units. So now we have that. Yeah, it's a, a battalion and other support units without being a full, you know, either full-powered or tank unit or full full sized motorized battalion but otherwise that's near a division so okay okay welded plate armor construction and all that really to a point sort of means is um the way i understand the mechanics and i am not the best person on the mechanics i'll say say that straight up on it but um the actual numbers on you know these manpower numbers these strength numbers if you will are not really what affects um how it does in combat what it does do though is how many losses it can take until and which also the percentage of losses affects organization and just how much damage it can sustain before it no longer is an effective unit so if you have larger manpower it can take more combat losses that's sort of the thing is so a, and so you can look here at some of these strength um, totals and compare them, you know, this soft attack to another unit soft attack and get that figured out. 
Uh, okay. Um, we're going to do advanced armor designs. Get that going. So we're going to crush Poland. That is not a um, in doubt. This is just going to happen. Um, Poland basically, historically at least, had one um, armor division, and that may be it. And I don't know how many it has right now. And uh, yeah, I'd say it's a light division. Or light tanks, if you will. Infantry support weapons advance, great. And we put this somewhere else. Through security units. Yes, we want to. We're going to be occupying many areas, and we want good security units there. Good for various reasons. Combat, or in oppression, or other sorts of things. Okay, um... JG-54, so do we have JG-54 somewhere already? Yeah, just immersion, but might as well. And I don't know if we have JG-7. No Rotomi. No, we don't. So we will... Let's see, um... There, put it here. Being prepared to defend our western um, resources, or, or ICs, that kind of thing. Some bombers. If things go right, I actually want them to come in and attack. And, um, and yes, we're going to take some losses, uh, or um, some damage, I should say. Maybe not losses so much, but damage to some of the to some of the ICs and to the um, uh, resources. But um, it's just what tank factories and a few other things may not be buildable. No tank factories are not. Um, okay. We need more money. Somebody offered to buy supplies from us. Yeah, there we go. Because if they come in and we can chew them up with our air power, they will then take those bombers back to Britain or France or wherever else and start spending the money to um, repair them. So it's actually, I think, can be a um, favorable strategy. They come in. Okay, um, it's flexibility. Okay, we want to stop that. Already got that one going. We got all the good ones. They're being researched or um, up to date there. Okay, here. Um, well, we can start doing inner service. That's not too far ahead. We want to do that. An infantry guy, yay. Okay, air landing equipment, jungle warfare equipment, air landing infantry. Let's do jungle warfare equipment. These take a long time. And I plan on going down there eventually, so it'll be useful. Get it done before we start heading down to Africa. Now, I really like the old um, the era Gato um DLC, in which if you research the um, the northern, I know it starts with a W, and I recently heard 
a person pronounce it who's probably pronouncing it right. I'm going to butcher it, so I'm deciding not to say it. Um, but I know the name of it. Just going to mangle it too badly to, to say right now. Um, had it so that if you researched it and you came in and you declared war on um, Denmark, basically they just surrendered because that's more or less what happens. I I think that would be a good idea is to have that as a... Oh, I just figured it was going to be in tank weapons. What is it? Okay, rolling artillery barrages. That is too far ahead to keep pushing. Yes, I agree. No, oh, now we can do spearhead doctrine. Do we want to do that? Yeah... No, these other ones are good too. Oh yeah. Yeah, I'm being decisive here, not knowing what to do. No, that's a time to trip and sure. Now let's bracket pile movers. Rocking primer, not track, okay. And we need something else too. Looks like at the top, um, oh, radio, infantry, radio communications. We're not America, we can push ahead and get those fancy radios down to the platoon level. Well, let's start pushing ahead with Air Force H. I've also sent off my um, covert um, operating subs here. Well, they're here. Those guys are going down to Horn of Africa. These guys are going to be in the Mediterranean operating. Okay, well, since nobody's volunteering to. Buy my stuff, we'll do a bit of a sales push here. On supplies. Okay, radios have advanced. And dual purpose. AK and anti tank. Go, which will stop that. But we've got those, which will help us out considerably, I think. And let's do oh, number recognition. Okay. Ah. Uh, They've got their escort. Just thinking, how much more escorts do I want to do versus night fighter type operations? I know they start out without much advantage, but they will gain once they get the right... Um, Well, uh, no, we're going to just deploy them independently, I think, at the moment. Okay, you can have that. Fighter command down here. There we go. Oh, sorry about that. Leg started to fall asleep there. So changing the position will help it. And monumental architecture, which is very 
could give us a new big shiny building of some sort. And, well, let's move this over to supply transportation. And there we go. Probably, maybe what I should have done though is we will stick this because we do want this very badly, but we don't really need to worry about supply um, transportation so much for um, Poland and France. Getting further afield, absolutely, we need to start worrying about that. We're still overproducing there. I pump that up and I pump that up. Now we'll get to back producing those, especially once we get some of these completed here. It will take a while, but they will be useful. Very useful. Our overall revolt rates doing oh pretty good okay thought about um, probably not for this um, though I would really love to get back to modding this stuff more just I constantly feel it's um something of a dead end um, but after doing some reading on the levels of um, foreign workers in Germany, um, increasing the re overall revolt risk as you take um, some more um, uh, territory countries down, and in, but including in Germany. And it's not really that, oh, it's going to break out... Um, with you know partisans in Germany um, revolt risk kind of thing but just the idea that forcing you to maintain um, the security the um, SA units and other things internally in Germany that dealing with and I say um, foreign labor it's not all forced um, there is all kinds of um, recruitment programs and posters come work in Germany get good pay and good ration books and whatever else that too then of course there's also slave labor uh, you know you know there, there's it's everything from voluntary to slave labor and stuff in between which is various quotas and various things and a lot of the non-slave labor you, some of it is sort of um, foreign quotas that were put on that the foreign governments uh, you know occupied occupied governments had to um, meet certain quotas and they got to pick who was going to be in uh, who was you know gonna go and that kind of thing and some of it may be a bit forced a bit more conscripted shall we say um, as well by the Germans um, but they weren't housed in concentration camps they were just they were you know housed amongst the populace often I, I presume without um, you know the in the US Constitution um, Bill of Amend uh, you know, uh, uh, Bill of Rights the first ten amendments of it uh, one of them is not to have troops quartered on your um, your house. Now, most Americans don't even know they have the right to not have troops stationed and you know quartered in their house. Like, say, oh, we need to house your we need to house troops somewhere. We're going to stick them in your house. Um, that's what the British used to do, and they used to do it in Britain um, very much so, and really pissed the colonies off once they were they um, started doing it in the colonies, just like, like oh, hey, you've got a big house, the soldier's going to come and live there. And he's going to, you know, maybe have maybe have an allowance that he gives you for food, but you're basically responsible for feeding him. You know, again, you might get a, and it depends, and I don't know all the details, but in different times, but uh, when you're they were quartering the troops on the populace, you still know in England, they specifically had a... Um, uh, an allowance for food more than just the pay um, that they were theoretically at least supposed to turn over to the um, to you know whatever to pay for the food but 
actual coming up with and preparing the food was, you know, the household, whoever was doing it in the household. And you didn't have, you know, you just get this soldier armed. Normally he didn't necessarily have any bullets, at least in Britain, you know. A lot of times soldiers didn't have any bullets in their guns or their guns because um, they were in the armory. They shot. Britain was probably some of the best trained troops in Europe, at least in actual shooting. They probably shot about 30 times, 30 rounds a year. And that's about it. I think it's about 30, maybe it's 60. But that's very high for most nations that actually in peacetime shoot that many rounds. Where most of like the France, you know, I'm thinking, I don't know, maybe Frederick the Great um, Prussian army shot more. But um, most of the time they just um, went through the motions of loading and firing the gun without any ball or powder in it. And so that was just dumb training. Now, the British did lots of that, too, going through the motions, the drill, uh, loading and firing the gun um, as well. But the British did fire a bit, a bit more live rounds than most other nations. Now, also remember, in peacetime, particularly when this is what we're talking about, um, the British Army is much smaller than other nations so that they could, you know, maybe put the same budget towards it that France did, but just, you know, it only has the tenth of the size of the army or something. So you get to shoot a lot more. But so, you know, they're armed with their musket and it's normally, un uh, you know, no bullets for it in most of the time in peacetime. And they might have some powder and some shot, but not much. It's normally just their bayonet, literally, just sort of as a big knife or stick it on um, the musket as a, um, you know, a pike. And so you, they quartered their, the people on, um, in Britain at least, on the populace a lot. And that was sort of the way the regiments were. It was very rare that they built barracks, very rare. One particular area that they built them in is Scotland because they were basically um, there as occupying troops on the populace. And there were, you know, few, like I say, rare um, military garrison um, around Britain. Most of the time the soldiers lived with um, and were inter interspersed amongst the people. Where I know a lot of times in like um, Frederick um, the Great's army and other armies, they were lived segregated from the populace in garrison barracks. Now, often they had women and children living in um, the garrisons. Now, no, in Britain it starts to change around the Napoleonic Wars. They start building um, dedicated um, uh, garrisons. And yeah, and the, the other some of the major exceptions are are troops that are um, stationed inside fortresses that generally you know coastal fortresses in Britain had some barracks levels of that kind of thing. But so in Britain, the army is very much interspersed daily living in amongst the population. Often during peacetime, they also had um, non-military jobs that they just sort of somehow found or, you know, created for themselves as a cottage industry to make money above and beyond soldiering. So this really, you know, once that gets done over in America, really pisses off the Americans so you can't quarter troops on your... Um, on the populace, it's, it's against the Constitution. But that could also be um, uh, quartering um, other people, you know, in your house, government's um, quarter, you know, it's just saying, oh, they're gonna come and live there in, on your property. Well, that's sort of what was happening, well, for evacuees from cities, that was definitely happening in Britain and Germany and other places. Um, during the war that they were trying to get um, particularly um, children but also women away from um, the pop city populations into the country and sort of forcing um, you know the, 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 the standard populace to take on these um, evacuees but they were also sort of taking on forcing the populace to take on um, guest workers of one a fashion or another and most of them, you know, had a pass. And it says that they live in, you know, um, Stuttgart or Dusseldorf or wherever it is. And they work at such and such factory. And so if they're found too far away from it without another pass that, you know, that has a time stamp on it, you know, um, this weekend you get to go, you know, somewhere else for, for a few days, you know, to get out of town or something. Otherwise, you were sort of restricted, and since this is a police state with all these SS, SA, German policemen, um, reservists, all kinds of people moving around, um, being various security forces, 
they're checking these passes all the time on the Reichsbahn, uh, you know, the railways. There's Reichsbahn type people that are, that are checking the passes. So you have, even though you may not be living inside a barbed wire camp, being a slave labor kind of thing, you know, that's very slave labor. You may be a forced laborer or even a guest worker, but you can't leave your your area of, um, you know, supposed living and working without other permissions. So I've been thinking about the idea of having to maintain these type of units around to maintain low, low revolt risk. But as you expand, because it's presumed within the game mechanics, um, as you, you know, you get a percentage of, um, you know, manpower from these places. And part of that is thought to be not so much French volunteers into the Charlemagne division or something. It's just French workers working in German factories, freeing up um, Germans to go fight in other things. So just something I've been thinking about. There's a lot of stuff I'd like to do. Um. But I just, with Hearts of Iron 3, still see this as a, as a dead end um, endeavor. Where I see so many, so many possibilities with um, Hearts of Iron 4. Okay. Um, refit and expand the tenth. Okay. Uh, yeah. Bank for international settlements. Always take this as much as we can. And reorganize the armament organization of the Reich. Um, you know, Fritz Tote really, he wasn't a, um, a Speer. Not that Speer is necessarily some super great genius. He isn't. But he does have a, a talent for organization. So does Tote. But there's a big, big difference between Tote and Speer. Tote was an SA um, leader. That's an SA uniform there. That's what organization Tote has. Whereas Brown, because it comes from this sort of Tote's SA background. And, you know, he sort of gets noticed for um, building the Autobahn so well, and then gets noticed for building the Reich, or the West Wall. And so Hitler notices him, and it's all right. And he meets with Hitler a, a fair number of times. And so, um, you know, it's sort of like, you know, a good manager and whatever, and can, can sort of see Hitler some, once in a while. Where Speer is sort of like Hitler's buddy. When, you know, when Hitler doesn't want to talk politics anymore, he wants to go talk to Speer. Um, like, it's interesting, uh, different, is um, maybe most Europeans, I don't know, no, no, former talk show host, he's now retired, Jay Leno, um, had the Tonight Show in America, Americans will know who he is. Well, when he'd meet people, they'd all want to talk about him being a comedian or him being, you know, talk show host or whatever. And he didn't care to talk talk to people about that. It, not that he would refuse to or be unfriendly, but he didn't want to. He just does, doesn't. That's his job. He doesn't. You know, once he's done with his job, his job, he wants to go off and do something else. What he wants to talk to people about is cars. He lo he's a car collector. He loves, um, you know, old cars and interesting cars. So if you want to go talk to him about cars, he'd love to sit there and talk to you all day long. And it doesn't care that. You know, if you're if you know about cars and you're interested in cars, um, you know, he could talk to you all day long about it, and you'd be, you know, but if you start bringing up him being a star and him being, you know, his day job, he just sort of like, meh, whatever, doesn't doesn't, you know, not interesting to talk to you. Well, Hitler's big thing was is once he gets away from politics, is architecture. So Spears is sort of architecture buddy. You know, let's 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 just hang out and look at, and look at the models that we're developing and talk about developing um, German cities or this new whatever. So and you know if um, Spears shows up at the Berghof, just literally just drives in his automobile, um, he'll get waved in and he'll get put up somewhere in the Berghof, um, whether in the actual building where Hitler lives or in one of the other outer buildings and. Just sort of like it's dinner, 
shows up at dinner. Spear, Spear gets to sit down at the table. They, with the Berghoff, they would do sort of the um, daily, I think it was maybe around 1 or 2 o'clock in the afternoon, um, walk from the Berghoff up to the um, tea house thing that was up there. Um, well, Spear could just come along whenever he felt like it. He had, didn't have to be invited. He could just show up and there. Now, when they would walk up to there and often walk back, um, who was standing next to, who was, because normally the gaggle would follow, oh, I don't know, 20, 30 feet behind Hitler as he was walking up there. And there'd be like one or two people walking next to Hitler. And then maybe he might sort of dismiss it. Oh, well, go get so-and-so behind you. And so he would talk to individuals, you know, as sort of a somewhat of a private time that, you know, the, the 10, 20 minutes or whatever it is to, to walk up there and then to walk back. So it was sort of, you know, a chance to sort of private talk with somebody. And, but then the whole gaggle of would all sit around in the same tea house thing with, you know, some of the secretaries and other girlfriends of Ava Braun or whatever, and, you know, Joseph Goebbels' wife, and those, some of the women, plus some of, you know, the guys, and they would all just sort of hang out and, and not talk so much politics necessarily, just hang out and, at the tea thing and then, then walk back down. Speer could just show up at any time, and he was there. You didn't, you didn't, you're not like, why are you here? It's no, hey, he just shows up, you know, and it's like he comes in, it's dinner time, a place will be, you know, he's there, place will be set for him. Now, that doesn't mean that Hitler's going to necessarily, you know, spend all the time talking to Speer. He's talking to everyone at the table, but Hitler can just be there at any moment without an invitation at any time. Tote couldn't do that. Tote could call up and get permission to come there. You know, what is he going to talk about? What does he want to talk to the Fuhrer about? Oh, okay. And he would get in. Probably whenever he felt he needed to, he would get in. But Speer could just be there hanging out, being around, talking to Goering, talking to Himmler, talking to whoever it is, and know the ins and outs and power politics. And so um, when you get in a fight with Speer, you're getting in a fight with somebody, you know, in, in sort of, you know, Nazi... Um, politics you're getting uh, the fight with somebody who can get hitler on the phone almost any time you know that he's awake or um can show up and talk to hitler at any time and so no matter almost how important you are you've got to be somebody like himmler somebody like goebbels somebody like goring particularly you've got to be that kind of level to sort of if you will outrank your access and um attention from hitler so that is one of the reasons spear has more success also that um, Tote gets killed fairly early on. Um, so, because Speer, during, during, as armaments minister, having has battles throughout the time with various um, Gauleiters and um, other sort of interests, he's constantly battling. And it's, um, you know, he's winning a lot of the battles, but there's a lot of obstruction going on as well. So, I think Tote would have been a fine armaments minister and... Um, Tote was doing a, a good job once he comes in and well, look at this. I, I do know that comes in, he, um, at, you know, right at around this time, getting ready for the um, invasion of the West, really ups um, uh, munitions, you know, ammunition production heavily at the, at the time. And so he, he's doing all right, but it's, you know, I don't know who is a better organizer necessarily between... Um, Tote and Speer, but Speer with his access, his clout, just completely outranks and so much. That's why he gets so much done. That's part of the why Speer does so well um, in the armaments um, industry because it's it's a rare thing um, that and and there are maneuvers and there are things that um, because Speer um, uh, sort of um, sides with Milch, I believe, if I have that right. I know Guderian, uh, when Guderian becomes um, sort of inspector of Armored Corps, really supports him, but even that, they get a little outmaneuvered that heavy um, tanks are not under the tank command. Because even that, you know, they don't win every battle, but it's just that kind of thing. And so Speer is, that's why Speer is so good. That's why I rate him so highly within this game. Okay, Fritz Tote, an engineer and master road builder, when appointed um, Minister of Weapons and Munitions, ushered in a new era for the efficient use of German industry and labor force. As Minister for Munitions and Weapons, 
Tote, however, saw a more efficient use of raw materials in Hitler's um, arms um, machine. Um, important note, keep him as armament minister to, to enable the whole German armament event chain. Okay, so we need to keep him there. I guess maybe until he dies. Um, we'll gain a lot of that kind of stuff. Oh, we'll um, not. So that that's pretty good. And um, Nazi Germany was a was designed to be an inefficient, designed by Hitler to be an, an inefficient administration, because Hitler really, really believed in that sort of competition kind of thing, um, and so that he wants different departments to fight it out over. Because I've recently learned Goering had his own intelligence service, which I didn't know about. And it's primarily a, um, or almost exclusively a, um, a technical intelligence service. And it was outside of anybody, it's out, out, not under Himmler's control and not under um, uh, Canaris's control as, as the Abwehr. It's his own intelligence service and it isn't even necessarily, I don't think, though I think it does use Luftwaffe personnel. It's not even so much part of the Luftwaffe. It's more of a... Um, uh, based out of the four-year plan and Reichswerk Hermann Goering kind of stuff. And it's mainly a, um, a listening service for um, intercepting telephone communications within Germany as well as radio and other communications, including, you know, um, trying to listen in on um, ambassadors, you know, embassies talking and other types of things. And it's, and it's really sort of a, um, you know, a, a listening service that's going on. So, meaning it doesn't have spies in Britain, it doesn't have um, people running around, you know, being playing spy or other intelligence gathering or so much around Germany. It start as it's somewhat dealing with the industrialization um, type policies. So, um, so I recently so Goering is is doing intelligence, and so he he's the one um, that gets some of the information about. Um, possible plans of France and Britain, which they they were sort of planning on, on invading. Um, that's well, invading Norway and Sweden a bit, partially to secure the iron up here, but mostly to, to go in and fight the Soviets. Um, but that stops basically once um, you know Finland surrenders and and gives in, gives up the border situation. Uh, and then they're sort of. Um, you know, but there is further plans to mine some of this region up here. But Britain, particularly as well, they think once they start mining, um, you know, this area up in here that Narvik comes out through. Once you start mining that up, then Germany is going to invade. So they're preparing counter invasion troops. Um, so um, Goering picks up on some of this, tells Hitler. So. So that's why Germany goes in before that, before the mining, because they think Britain is going to go in, when really they're just sort of talking about, at least mostly talking about, um, well, because there's various people talking about different things, but they're mostly just talking about um, being prepared to go in. Um, okay, we have another almost a half point. Um, Bombay, that's good, but let's come down here and look. Got special forces and those guys. And so, Ger so Hitler reacts to that and um, goes in. Oh, we want Jaiba. And that's what sort of pushes them into to Norway quicker, sooner, more, and that's sort of Goering picking up on that stuff. So, okay, we don't really care. Light bomber prototypes have advanced. Good. Well, let's see here. Um, we're going to get to all of those. Uh, 
out. So you need to understand all this types of stuff to really, if you're going to try to understand the National Socialist Regime. So, you know, you're going to have the Abwehr running around doing intelligence. You're going to have the um, German Foreign Office, um, first under Van der Rohe, later under um, uh, Ribbentrop doing intelligence gathering, because that's what emb um, you know embassies do. They're doing intelligence gathering. You have, um, did I say the Abwehr? I probably did. Then you have the SS um, under, um, uh, what's his name? Um, uh, what is it? Schellenberg. Um, yeah, Walter Schellenberg doing um, overseas intelligence gathering as well, as well as, you know, uh, him, or uh, Reinhard doing internal. Um, Intelligence gathering. So you've got all that going on, and and then you got this Goering base um, stuff, and then of course you know you do still have naval intelligence and whatever else. Though that sort of comes under the AB there, my understanding at least. All the military non-SS type intelligence um, comes under the um, AB there. At least that's my understanding of the situation. That's coming over here. Oh, um, research. No. And so Hitler likes it that way. He thinks that by all this duplication, one, it, it, it creates a, a, a competing within them, you know, everyone trying to do a little bit better because they want to outdo somebody else, you know, within it. Um, so there's that competition, plus just different minds um, running it will think differently. And he's right about that, but obviously you can get over overlap of four people all trying to tap the same embassy's phones. <laughs> you know, so you could theoretically imagine some, some, let's say the U.S. Embassy in Berlin before the war starts, you could have the SS trying to tap those phones. You could have Goering's people trying to tap the phones. You, you know, um, you know, like the SS means sort of the Gestapo, and they're trying to do that. You could have um, the, you know, a German foreign ministry trying to tap those phones. And they all have, you know, their own little taps on, you know, the wires and outgoing. And you could have all this duplication of effort when all you need is just one set of people listening to every phone phone call however much manpower that would would um, take coming in and out of the embassy um, so you know it's good and it's bad just how it's run and the way the nazis did wasn't the best okay so we can do salt guns it looks like now um so we'll stop the short barrel let's come over here and look here no here Wait, do we want to do that yeah i think we do And um, new monumental architecture for the nation. Okay. Okay, let's see the plans. Um, yeah, we've got enough money and supplies, so great. We'll do that. Um, Work Zeitung. This is a um, Hermann Goering lens, which is, I've learned more and more about it. The overall lens base, um, Hermann Goering Berg, is very large, whether it's this Alpine. Montan AG uh, as part of it is very big. I, I presume it's all part of the greater um, area of, of this stuff, but this is a um, another steelwork. So, another sort of this is one of the early events that I did that doesn't have an effect that should could have a little like another steel factory or something added to it. Okay, German staff, a German Italian staff um, consultations 1940. Um, they definitely did do these. I was recently. Um, reading about them uh, but there was remarkably very little co actual coordination but let's see what um, I believe this is revolver held um, has to say about this 
The military coordination between the two Axis partners under the Pact of Steel did not develop in the early stages of the war in preparation of KHL leaders and high-ranking military staff started to consider the participation of 12 Allied Italian divisions. Fully aware that Italy's shortcomings in the, its um, preparation for war, Hitler and Mussolini both wanted to push for Italy's entry into the war. However, for various different reasons proven um, proven uh, by thorough OKW analysis of Italian capabilities, any such closer cooperation with them will uh, with them will possibly allow to allow to increase the Italian military potential. Besides the transfer of our theoretical and practical knowledge to them, it might be necessary to deliver coal and other valuable support. We shall, shall we proceed? This is something also I was just reading about, and this is one thing I haven't been tech sharing with Italy very well. Um, for this coal that um, Italy wants. And so this is what was happening. Um, Italy needs coal. Most of the coal is coming from Germany. Not all of it, but a good chunk of the coal is coming from Germany. And um, the Brenner Pass, just as a train setup, just isn't able, capable of moving too much of the coal. So what it was doing was coming out of German ports and sailing around to Italy. Well, once the war starts up, that becomes impossible. So they shift it to Rotterdam. Now, uh, so so chain, trains or barges or whatever go to Rod Rotterdam get um, put on board Italian ships and it gets shipped over to Italy. Well, Britain sort of cuts this off and then sort of, okay, well, you can continue to do it um, through Rotterdam for coal. And then at some point, um, I don't know if around now, April or May or somewhere, um, Britain stops this and um, inters, uh, you know, um, grabs still neutral Italian shipping and inters it coal ships um, filled with coal. That's what you put in coal ships, and this outrages Mussolini. So, um, but to get this German continued coal and promise, um, because it needs this coal, even if it's going to be coming across, you know, down through the Brenner Pass on trains, um, Germany is really super short of particularly um, copper. So, Italy has to provide a lot of copper to get this coal, and it doesn't have the copper ready. So what it does do is basically has all the copper pan, household copper pans and um, brass um, sort of furniture or whatnot, um, plates and from the churches, all confiscated and melted down to be shipped to Germany. So to provide Germany's need for copper, they, they rob the Italian populace's copper pans. I just find that really funny. And they, I mean, this is, they did this on large scale, and there wasn't really so much of a choice. And I don't know if they, they probably handed the, the housewives or whatever some some paper lira or whatever. But still, it's like you're going to turn over your copper so we can supply Germany its copper needs. That's how crazy some of this stuff is going on. And I really, I really say crazy that that Germany is going to world war when it's just not ready for it. It's just really stupid. Okay, so um, we lose some energy, some supplies, and some metal. We can afford all of that, just barely the metal, unfortunately. Um, and we improve our relations, get some advisor effects, or not do this. No need. Well, Italy needs some of that stuff, so combined arms coordination, inner service HQs, yes. Let's see what we can do with um, Italy, and I just normally don't, I don't just quite honestly play the um, diplomatic um, war, air technology. Hmm, ours, theirs, okay. Okay, so, well, um, mechanical engineering, See, that's hardly any better, I mean, obviously, it's better rocket science, I don't really care, what it could, submarine engineering, electronic engineering, that would be good, be playing stuff, right? 
Okay, well. One point in leadership. Do I want to do this? Okay, we will do this. Uh, which means we're going to have to come over here and now update our diplomacy. We'll take it away from our officers. Stop that there. And we're going to come here and we're going to a little more away from our officers. Not a lot, but a little bit. Okay, which does give us more research capabilities. These will go fast, so we want to start doing some of these, though. Um, medium artillery and anti tank, and we barely one more. Um, let's do. I'll just do engineers here. Okay, allies um, request transit rights from Sweden and Norway. Without an official finished request for the deployment of an allied expeditionary force. Again, revolver held. I presume you'll be watching this. You need to have a check here to see that Finland is at war. That uh, I presume, I don't know if you have it, um, check that um, Sweden and Norway are neutral. But Finland needs to be at war since we've not actually triggered the first stages this isn't happening yet um, just simply um, tie it to Finland being at war uh, okay um, and this is what I was talking about before um, to know we were gonna have this but the real sort of invasion that Britain and France the way they want it to go is they want to come in here grab Narvik um, grab the sort of uh, Swedish steel to stop them from uh, getting any more to um, Germany and then move across whether they're capturing more territory or not um, move across um, Finland to fight the Soviets and come up to um, uh, uh, Pestamo here to secure the um, uh, iron ore which I guess here is technically where it is there's iron ore, nickel, and whatnot up here. Sort of shows up as rare materials. Um, they want to grab that as well to keep that out of Soviet slash German hands because they're um, with the joint invasion of Poland. Um, the Western Allies are looking at the Soviets as, although they don't want to go to war with them, but they're thinking about it over Finland um, as an expeditionary force. Um, they're looking at that, that they're active German allies, um, Nazi allies, so they don't want to secure all this. The French want to do it big time just simply to try to move the war away from their borders. The French are just, um, if you will, um, panicked. I don't, yeah, panicked is maybe good about fighting another world war on their territory, so they're looking for almost anything to have a war in some other field. They th I think they think it's going to be like the um, when they sort of invaded down, I think it's in Salonika area here, they sort of created a um, voluntary um, concentration camp uh, by sending a you know large group of forces that just sort of got stuck down here and sat for a long time. They think there's going to, um, you know, in World War One. um, they think they're going to come in, obviously the Dardanelles is a, another sort of thing, but they think it's going to come in and sort of create another sort of stalemate front somewhere that the Germans are going to have to send lots of troops to, and they could come down and, and hang on and like someplace like in Greece and fight the war in some other theater and move it away from the decision point in France is what they're hoping. And so they're hoping to get all this, um, the intention to land in um, Dorbreth and Novik to occupy the Swedish iron. There's hope that the Allied intervention would eventually bring the neutral Nordic country, Norway and Sweden, not to the Allied side, strengthen their position against Hitler. Okay, so this is what's planned. Um, uh, good to know, but I would... Um, I'd also make this some sort of choice kind of thing. 
as well. I don't know. It's just because they're planning. And they were sort of pushing. Um, they decide not to invade. Um, no, actually, let's, I'm trying to remember. They were thinking about inv uh, Churchill wants to um, mine neutral Swede or Nor neutral Norwegian waters that would um, either sink um, transport vessels or force the transport vessels out into international waters so that they could sink them with British subs. Um, they sort of ask Norway, would this be okay? Norway says no. You know, not in a sort of secret ask. You know, could we just sort of privately do it and you don't don't let on that you know that we're doing it kind of thing? But they say no. And then there's this French push to move troops up into here. Um, and they're negotiating with these countries. They both are being pressured and so yeah mm, I don't know some but I guess this is being pushed by Britain so we don't necessarily have a choice there so I get okay I so I I'm now agreeing now I'm thinking this is not Germany's choice this is whether it's Britain's choice and if they've already sort of prompted something I don't know um, the best way and without knowing this the best way would be to have a and I don't again I don't know how you've done it revolver held you don't have to tell me I can go in and look if I want to. Um, so I'd have a British and or um, a French event based on um, still to check for um, them to be at war with the Russians, the Soviets, that then if they want to um, ask for permission, they would then ask, which you can say the AI will always do, but to say if we're playing this as a multiplayer um, game sometime in the near future, they would be able to... Um, ask which may always be turned down by these if they're being played by the ai that then would give this notice for germany so that yeah, okay um government um oppression we're going to appease them i want to keep the revolt risk down once we're at war because this national revolt risk does go outside of Germany, so we're going to do a peace. We're back to a peace, yes. Which means more. But once we go into war, oh god, that's a big one. We're going to be no war soon, thankfully. That's huge. Okay, it's just April. Once we go to war, that'll be cut down. Okay. Dachau. Just so you know, um, Dachau, of course, is famous as a concentration camp. And it most assuredly was, and it was sort of formed as a do uh, concentration camp. Not by the SS, but by the SA, if I remember correctly. The SS take it over very shortly after. It sort of formed in the early days of 33 when, you know, the, the takeover is. But the SA... They just have a lot of br brutal thugs just being thuggish to the inmates. And there's all kinds of inmates being taken in. Some they definitely don't want to see ever again. Others they just sort of want to re-educate them. You know, so put them in the camp for six months and go, Hey, you better behave or you can come back to this camp. But if you brutalize somebody to the point of, you know, maiming them or killing them or something, they're never going to like you. But if you put them into a camp, you work them, they also, you know... But you, you know, and some people were definitely tortured under the SS. I'm not saying the SS were good guys, but they weren't, the SA were just doing it as, as random, you know, not as a, as a purpose. It was just like, oh, pick out, you know, thugs being thugs and just picking people out and torturing them and whatnot. Where the SS, it was, um, uh, you know, there was reasons behind their torture. Again, it doesn't make it okay or anything. It just, there's reasons behind it. And so some people there, they want to just put in, hey, look, you could end up in this camp forever, but, you know, you're in for six months, you're, you know, you got to do labor, you got to do a lot of harsh, you know, calisthenics and other works, and then now that you've been re-educated to the good National Socialist way, we're going to let you out, but don't worry, we're keeping our eye on you, so you better behave, and that kind of thing. And there was a lot of people that were coming in and out of Dachau, but Dachau also... Um, 
they the SS bought the Alaric porcelain company and I think they didn't use concentration camp labor to make the porcelain but they moved it to part of Dachau they also had um, uh, they had a bunch of manufacturing there that was sort of Dachau based slave labor um, you know manufacturing uniforms and badges and whatnot for the SS um, they also had a, a experimental holistic foods farm techniques going on there and there are large um, areas that did have slave labor running the farms. They also have like the Women's SS Training Center there and some other SS training centers that weren't, you know, were part of the greater Dachau complex, but weren't necessarily part of the concentration camps. And let's see the plans for the broadcasting. Yes, okay, so. Okay, so we have news and politics, major movies, studios, heroic tales. Um, well, let's look at some of these and why we don't maybe have some more of those. Okay, um, because we have our, um, no, we probably don't have enough steel for some of these. Uh, we may hold off on some of these guys. Major movie studios, okay, yeah. Your National Police Building. Um, why don't we have some of these? Okay. Maybe the lack of... Well, we got lots of supplies. Got lots of money. Okay, well, let's do the, um, the radio one right now. We'll hold off on the others for a little bit. Because I don't... I, I don't ever really plan on getting a movie studio. Um... Well, these other ones I want. Okay, um, hmm, uh, what radio? Okay, I don't know that we need to go, well, that would be nice right now, but, um, we're not going to need so much once we go to war. Um, heroic Tales would be nice. Territorial Pride, National Unity Organization, Regain Rate. And Huge News would be nice, but it's sort of huge. Um, yeah, we'll just go with Heroic Tales. So let's... Let's not spend too much and just get heroic. Tales. There we go. And we're going to take this opportunity to end the episode here. I want to thank everyone for watching. I want to thank you for liking the videos. I really do appreciate that. And, of course, please um, post questions, comments, suggestions, ideas, corrections. Love hearing from you. See you next time for more Hearts of Iron.